Okay, so how is everybody? Everybody's obviously here wanting to talk about wireless. I, I'm surprised how many people we got in this. Man, we got a lot of people in the room today. Oof. So uh, I've got a couple of special guests today as well to kind of uh, correct me when I say things that are wrong and uh, <laughs> uh, keep me in line, keep me honest here a little bit. I'm going to have uh, Carl uh, Winkler from Electrosonics, very dear friend of mine, I've known him for many, many years. And also Joe Chaudelli, although it looks like he's having trouble signing in, he's going to be here from Sennheiser uh, as well. Uh, so um, I guess maybe the way to do this right off the bat is just to kind of state, okay, first off, this is not any sort of shootout. Uh, we are not in the process of doing any sort of shooting out of products today. I've just kind of wrangled these guys into lending me some of their product to make uh, the demonstration here today and, and get things going. So... Uh, don't take it as a shootout. We're just going to try to stay practical today and just talk about application and uh, how to get things to sound better or keep things from sounding bad. All right. And peace. Everybody good with that? All right. Uh, also want to, might as well give some shout outs to those companies too. Jerry Harvey, I want to give him a shout out as well. Uh, he's been providing some stuff for the lab lately too. So uh, all the guys, Kevin, Glenn Denning and all those guys, thank you. If you're listening in. All right, so let's get started here, and I'll just try to keep an eye on the door. So we are going to talk about audio gain structure in RF systems today. And, uh, you know, the reason I, I kind of picked this topic is twofold. Uh, you know, I, as I mentioned to Carl earlier, you know, I do a lot of consulting for a lot of, you know, artists. I do consulting for houses of worship, all kinds of stuff. And I'm constantly amazed at how poorly I see this piece of it handled and how often this is the source of problems uh, in their setups, whether it's in their microphone systems or their ear systems, uh, etc. And, you know, and I'll fully admit, man, it's just one of those things. It's so easy to get things out of whack and not realize it. And then on top of it, if I can be any more mysterious about it, you know, our ability to adjust gain structure in an RF system is not that handy, right? It's just we don't have a really nice ability to actually take control of these additional audio stages at the consoles today. You know, when we were in analog, everybody kind of conceded that, you know, we're not going to have an analog console that's going to give us access to that kind of stuff. But now in the day of digital console and digital transmission, digital systems, you know, remote control of receivers, et cetera, you know, we need, I'm going to just say it, we need to get to a point as mixers where we can get control of this initial audio stage in these systems, right? So as you'll see, it's critical to the whole game. All right. So let's get going here. So today, as you can, I'm just going to block diagram out an RF system here. This is not meant to represent any system that I got going today. This is very uh, generic. And you can see that it's, you know, a wireless microphone system is actually pretty complex, right? I mean, there's lots of stages in it, especially for an analog system like this one's talking about, where you got, you know, pre-emphasis, limiter, FM modulator, blah, 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 all that aside from the audio. But for the context of what we're going to talk about in today's lab, we're going to not, first off, we're going to not talk about instrument level, right? Trying to get stuff that is instrument level to go back to a guitar amplifier and be handled properly or anything like that. That honestly could probably be a lab in and of itself trying to get instrumentation and guitar pickups to, uh, you know, go through the air, so to speak, and, and end up at an amplifier correctly so that you get the right uh, impedance matching and the right drive into that amplifier. That's, a, that's a, almost as much art as it is science there. So we're going to stay away from that today and just keep it in the realms of microphones and uh, lav mics for instruments, things like that, okay? And then on top of it, we're only going to talk about these sections of the path. We're not going to get into, you know, the FM modulation or the, you know, the digital modulation of the signals, even though that does have an impact on audio quality, of course. Uh, we're not going to talk about the day, that today. We're going to stay in the realm of gain structure. How do I just get the gain sorted out properly between these stages? And as you can see in the, you know, kind of in the block diagram, we have two additional stages ahead of our mic pre, one pre-transmission and one post-transmission that we have to deal with. And then on top of it, you know, in today's world, we also have digital outputs of that receiver mechanism. Maybe it's network, maybe it's Dante, you know, AES, you know, whatever. 
uh, that we also have to contend with. So, you know, uh, there's going to be an element of gain structure that we can, uh, that we're going to have to contend with there and manage. So, uh, all of that said, that's what we're going to tackle today. And so we're going to attack, I'm going to actually address it from two ends. We're going to talk about uh, microphone signal path, uh, you know, transmitted and received. And then we're going to flip it around and talk about console to ear mix, transmitted out, stereo mix out to uh, a set of ear monitors, which is a whole nother set of problems and challenges, okay? Uh, as always, I'll remind you guys, this is not necessarily meant for me to be the talking head. If you've got stuff that you want to interject, by all means do so. I'll try to keep my eyes, my, my window is very busy today, but I will try to keep my eyes on the chat here. Yeah, oh, so, so somebody saw Volker in the room, is that right? Is that what I heard? If so, that's great. So Volker, welcome. Volker uh, Schmidt from uh, Sennheiser is also in the room. So we certainly welcome that guy. He knows more about this than I've forgotten. So, all right, so let's, uh, let's move on here. Let's see where we go. So obviously this gets even more complex if we start talking about digital transmission now uh, because we have a preamp sensitivity, et cetera, that is going to be correlated to an A to D converter and then also uh, on the receiver side, have a D to A converter that is correlated to an audio output, uh, etc. Right? And, and actually, I'm just noticing my network and my AES blocks are on the wrong side of that D to A converter. So <laughs> we've already got a first mistake. I'll have to fix that in the edit. All right. So uh, the first place I want to start here before we even get into wireless is this situation here. I, I think I probably see this mistake happen more than any other mistake, and it just sends the whole thing into a tizzy when guys don't get this right. Uh, and again, I'm kind of surprised how many people don't have a really firm grasp of this. And it is the concept of devices having an output level and devices having an input sensitivity, meaning they're expecting a certain level to be driven uh, to line level, right, to get their level sorted out. So in this situation, you know, if we have a sine wave or, you know, your signal coming in at line level, the output of the device is generally going to be plus 4 dBm. And once we send that out, if we send it to a device that has an input sensitivity of plus 4 dBm, it will in turn drive that input right to the same level, right? We get that nice unity gain transfer there. Uh, so line level to line level there, coming one device to another, right? We've talked about this. If you guys go back to the gain structure, uh, discussion that I had much earlier in the labs you you know we were all over this we were talking about this sort of thing as well <clears throat> now we have another uh, standard out there which is the minus 10 dBV standard right which is kind of prosumer or consumer generally speaking and you know same sort of deal if we drive that up to 0 dBVU or minus 20 dBFS and we plug it into something that is expecting minus 10 dBV we get that unity gain pass through, right? It drives that next stage right to line level, and uh, you know both uh, both halves of the circuit are optimized uh, to be used, right? Just because we all of our mixer gear, most uh, with very few exceptions, all of our mixers are designed and optimized to work at line level, right? So if we have this, we're all good, everything's fine. But I got to mute some mics here. One in five Americans is now at least partially vaccinated against the virus. That's the good news. We're getting virus news. There we go. All right. So uh, this is output level and matching sensitivity, right? So once we do this kind of thing, it's all good. And, and I want to emphasize this really has very little to do with balanced versus unbalanced, uh, you know, uh, kind of thing. You know, this isn't, you know, on whole, I'll say more often than not, most balanced gear is plus 4 dBm. Most unbalanced gear is minus 10 dBv. But it, it's not a hard and fast rule. You can have balanced minus 10 dBv. You can have unbalanced plus 4. So it's not a matter of just matching balancing and unbalancing. There's an actual a level, an output level, and an input sensitivity that needs matching here. And we can get a sense of this when we do it wrong, right? And I see this pretty often. So when we, the thing to remember about these two kind of standards is they're actually referencing different things, right? The dBm is referenced to milliwatts, right? Uh, and plus 4 dB, or I mean minus 10 dBV is actually referenced to voltage. 
So if we want to look at the actual difference in these two things, I, I, it's a regular uh, kind of mistake in math here to look at the difference between those two things and think it's 14 dB of difference. It, it's not because they're referenced to two different things, right? So uh, milliwatts converted, uh, referenced in milliwatts converted to dB is actually uh, about 11.79 uh, DB. It's it just rounded it up to 12. I'm going to round it to 12 for the discussion here. Okay. So for instance, if we took plus four DBM uh, output and we fed it into a minus 10 DBV sensitivity, it's going to drive it really hot, right? There's going to be that 12 DB additional gain on it. And you're going to have to adjust that input uh, and turn it down to get some sort of unity pass through here, right? Uh, when in fact, really what you should do there is convert that plus four output to a minus 10 output level and then send it on into that input. Chances are you might even overdrive that input depending on how much uh, how much headroom it's got. And vice versa, if we take a minus 10 dBV output and feeding it into a plus four dBm input sensitivity, you know, obviously it's not going to drive it hard enough and get us up to line level. Now we've got to be adding gain on that level or adding gain on the drive to get it to max up and we get out of whack. And you know, my primary reason for bringing this up is if this isn't sorted out first, if this isn't sorted out first and firm, then doing other gain structure, uh, addressing other areas of gain structure becomes even just that much more difficult, right? It's just more, more confusing and the dog kind of chases the tail, so to speak. So you got to get this part of it sorted out. And I see this a lot with, um, you know, wireless systems going into, you know, lower end mixers, et cetera. There's a whole nother discussion that we're going to have here shortly on, well, do I make my wireless output mic level or line level? What, which should it be? And uh, the answer kind of, my answer kind of says, well, it depends. It depends on what you're trying to do with it and what kind of input you're bringing it into, maybe even what kind of source you're going to send. All right. So the, First things first, got to get this part of it sorted out. All right, so here's our little test grid that we're going to do today. That's our little test situation uh, that I've kind of devised. I, and I'll just throw out the disclaimer ahead of time. I have got a lot of moving parts in this lab today. So if this all works, I'm just going to be amazed to see us make it all the way through this and work. So what I've done is taken a Pro Tools session and uh, had some different outputs from it, a vocal output, I've got a horn output, like a trumpet output. And then of course, I've also got pink noise and tone. And I'm gonna take that out to an amplifier to a full range speaker. And then we're gonna mic that full range speaker with a number of different sources, right? So uh, SM58 on a cable, uh, an AT4056, which is a condenser mic on a cable. Then we're gonna look at a Sennheiser wireless, uh, we're also going to look at the electro, uh, electrosonics wireless. We're also going to look at a lav mic, which might be used for the horn or whatever. That's what I'm going to simulate today. And we're going to look at setting those levels today and getting them right. So you can see this wouldn't, this wouldn't be far off what you would run into with these systems, right? Now, of course, it's not going to be a real voice. It's not going to be a horn. This is simulated just to try to drive home the point. But I think one of the things you're going to see from doing this is how important it is to set that initial stage of gain and also how difficult that is to do kind of on a day to day basis when you're working. You know, if you have to work really fast, man, it's hard to get that set right because it requires somebody generally going to the microphone and adjusting it, you know, taking the mic from somebody and saying, hang on, I got to adjust your gain and then giving it back to them. You know, we haven't really really come up with the great way to do that remotely yet, which is, I th in my opinion, is very important to do. Okay. So that's kind of our test rig. Uh, I was hoping to show you some of this with overhead camera today, but I'm going to have to just do it on software here. So let me see here. Yeah. So that's our, so I'm going to take this away for a second and move it over here. So what you see on screen right now is the uh, software that uh, allows us to see any of these devices and what they're doing. So on the far left, that's the, um, uh, the Shure device. Uh, I got a Shure PSM 1000 here uh, with their uh, pair of those with uh, the receiver pack. So we're going to look at that gain structure a little bit. The one in the middle is the DSQD. This is from Electrosonics. This is what we're looking at there is a look into their receiver. And then on the right-hand side is the Sennheiser version. That's the WSM looking into the Sennheiser mic. 
All right. So let me get this part over there. So what we're going to do is, let's see, I'll do it here. So one of the things I, I always want to do when I'm kind of setting this up is I want to get a sense of how much signal needs to be coming into that microphone to get it to output line level, right? How much is it going to take? Because there's going to be some portion of that drive in the front end that's going to get line level out of that receiver device, right? So in so for this first little look at it, uh, we're just going to take some tone. Actually, I'm going to, I got to go change this over to tone. I'm just going to take a one one k tone out of our speaker, and we're going to just have all these microphones pick it up and then look at the resultant output uh, in their receiver, right? So you may hear a little bit of this tone. Yeah, I'll just give that so you know what it is. So let me kind of point out what's what you're seeing across these meters here. So we're, what we're looking at is the output of these receivers and, and in different formats. Uh, so the first channel that you see there is an SM58, okay, on a hardwire. The next channel is the AT4056 on a hardwire. The next one is the Electrosonics RF. Uh, that is uh, the handheld. Then we have the Sennheiser RF. That's a handheld. Uh, we have the next channel is Electrosonics, and this is looking at the Dante output from that particular receiver. And then the next channel is the uh, Dante output of the Sennheiser receiver. And then I actually added in the, the AES output of the Sennheiser re receiver as well. And the reason I, br I brought those in is because those can be your clue into how hard you're driving that system, right? Because remember, in terms of signal flow, the Dante outputs, the AES outputs, are not going to be subject to audio control on the output of that receiver. They're going to be fixed, right? So if you drive that the input of that si system to the proper level, you should get line level back from those Dante and AES outputs, right? We should see that. And consequently, if we're not driving it hard enough, you'll see that not enough level is coming out. So it can be like a really good measuring point. It, uh, to me, it's one of the blessings that have come, kind, of, kind of come with digital is that we can look at those digital outputs and get a real sense of how hard we're driving the input to initiate output from the receiver, right? And you can kind of see that here, right? So uh, I have the tone going into these microphones via that speaker. And if you take a look at the uh, AES and Dante outputs, that's with, let me just double check something here. That's with no trim on these channels coming back in and they're coming at, back in right at line level, right? So that tells you you've got enough gain on that transmitter to initiate line level on the output of that system. Now, what does that mean on the uh, the actual audio output? Well, on the actual audio output, if we look at that in the uh, Electrosonics and the Sennheiser, right now there's no plus or minus on the audio output. It's just a unity pass-through on the audio output, and guess what? It comes up line level, right? So we know we've got enough signal driving into that system on line level. Now, let's take a look at, remember the... Um, the, the analog outputs of the receiver are coming back into mic pre's here. Okay, so let's just have a look maybe on how much gain is on those mic pre's versus an actual wired system. And this is going to kind of speak a little bit to do I use line level or mic level coming back into my console? Because I, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule on it. You can use either. Uh, you know, the preamps in today's consoles have more than enough variance to be able to handle either one. So on the, let's start with, let's start with the 58 for one. So on the 58, I got plus 30 dB of preamp gain to get it to that level. All right. On the 4056, I've got 20 dB of gain, which would be expected, right? It's a condenser mic. I would expect more output on it. So that's okay. On the electrosonics, it's about 34 dB of gain at the mic pre. So, you know, that's basically coming in at the same level as a 58, roughly a 58. Whereas on the Sennheiser RF, only have 13 dB of gain there. So it's that's a pretty hot output 
uh, from that receiver uh, when we have it driven to line level output, right? That's, that's actually coming in kind of hot. So I think what I would say here is kind of depending on your application, right? Depending on your situation, let me mute this so we don't have to go crazy here. Actually, I'll leave it running here. Uh, you know, if I was going to have, if I was going to put up a wireless mic and use it and have, have a 58 on a cable that is going to be used as a spare and that spare was going to be plugged into the same channel as the wireless, like if I was just going to swap them out, right? Then I would definitely use mic level and re and reduce that level of that audio output of that receiver to match the gain of the microphone I'm going to replace it with or replace with it, right? So if it's a 58 I'm replacing with, I'm going to match that gain on the output of the receiver, not on the gain of the transmitter, right? That's where you want to make that adjustment and that match. Uh, I'm of that opinion, right? So same sort of thing. If I'm gonna, if I, if my spare is going to be a condenser microphone, maybe it's the 4056 for the Sennheiser. Same deal, right? I'm gonna take that microphone and match it to the actual analog output of my receiver, so that I can just plug in either mic, wired or wireless, and be good to go. Now I don't have to worry about that against the Dante channels and the AES channels, right? Those are definitely line level. You're not going to be able to bring those into a mic pre. They are line level. You can't get away from that if you're bringing them in digitally. But if you're, you know, if you're using your 58 on a separate channel versus your wireless channel, then it does. To me, it doesn't really matter. Then I would just as soon keep it at line level so that my Dante and my AES channels can serve as backups for the wireless mic at that point for the for the actual analog channel you guys follow that there right so it depends on your situation and i think more often than not you're going to probably have your spare cable your spare mic in a spare channel as well as your wireless mic and maybe even your dante or your aes inputs uh, sitting there as well uh, so you have uh, analog and digital line level versus wired mic level all right I can jump in, Robert, just and add a comment. Yeah. Uh, so the only thing that you sacrifice by doing that is a very slight amount of signal to noise. And it's because, as you've figured out, of course, that the uh, wireless receivers want to send line level out. And so if you're attenuating, knocking down by 20 or 30 dB, and then boosting that back up in a mic preamp, you're going to get a little bit more noise. But as you said, the preamps have plenty of range, and preamps these days are very quiet. Uh, it's probably not something you're going to notice in most uh, situations. Yeah, I, I, the thing I've noticed is I don't really have to back off the analog uh, output of the receiver very far to get it to match up with the microphone. You know, so it's it's really like I said, it's situational a little bit where you where you're just trying to match up the the two source levels the same. But if you're using them in separate channels anyway, I say who cares? Leave it at line level, right? All right, so let's uh, let's move on to maybe an example of that, and I, I, we're going to use the electrosonics uh, as an example here. So um, let me see what I got here. Uh, so this is an actual thing that I've seen happen in the past, um, where this is kind of how it can get out of whack here. Let me see if I've got that. Let me just do a little audio check here. Okay. So uh, I've got an Electrosonics uh, belt pack in there that's got a lavalier on it. And we're going to simulate this being an instrument mic. And I'm going to send some level to it. And what you're going to notice first is how good the level on output looks, right? So let me get it going here. So this, oops, this doesn't want to be in there. Sorry, my mistake here. Okay, so can you guys see my cursor there? I'm sorry, I don't have a confidence monitor today, so I'll just ask. Do you guys see my cursor? Yes, we can see it. Yep. Okay, so it's the the one that is outlined in the square there, right? <clears throat> so this channel is that Electrosonics uh, lav mic on that system. And, and you could look at it and just kind of go, well, that looks pretty normal, right? I mean, 
Let me check my mic pregame. Yeah, it's about 30 dB of gain. That doesn't seem out of line, right? But in actuality, what's happening here is that the input to that device is very low. And I'm going to kind of squeak over here and show it. So that is the device that is on the bottom here. And notice how low the drive is on that, right? It's, it's really not nearly enough signal to, to drive us out uh, to where we want to be. Uh, and let's see, I think I might be able to show that on the... Yeah, it's all right. So, you know, really what we want to do is find a way to get that gain up a little bit and uh, and get that get that transfer uh, through transmission a little more, a little better. And I'll let the wireless experts chime in on this. I, I know that, you know, having the wrong level here, certainly have too low of a level, can affect transmission as well as too much level. Like, all right, if we get it too high, then we're going to over-modulate that signal. It's not going to sound right. Uh, probably going to sound some, some some form of distortion in it. Uh, if we go too low, it's probably going to be noisy, and you know the sideband uh, of the situation is not going to work well at all because it's going to be competing with noise. So we have to find a way to get this up. Am I right in that, Carl? You want to back me up on that one? Or yeah, so when you're talking right? analog FM-based wireless, which has been what we've all known for many, many years, um, too low of a modulation of the audio can result in reduced range. And certainly... You're going to have to boost the gain somewhere else, which will bring up the noise floor. And there's always a certain amount of channel noise, uh, even with the best systems. So you want to get your modulation up on the audio on the front end. And then if you need to back it off somewhere else, that's going to also bring down the channel noise. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you talked about overloading. You know, analog wireless is required to have a limiter. You're not allowed to overmodulate. So you might hear heavy limiting if you're driving it too hard. And you could hear some, it certainly can sound like distortion and get into distortion of the audio, but it won't overmodulate if it's, you know, complying with the, with the rules. If the yeah, I, I've seen two examples of this in play and more often than not, I, I, it's amazing the workflow that I see go through this. So if somebody has the transmitter gain too low, the audio gain in the transmitter too low, what they'll do a lot of times is check and see if the receiver output is set at mic level. And if it is, they'll change it to line level. Or they'll they'll right. go and find another way to get way more gain there. You know they'll do it all on the back side of the signal, and and not address it here. And uh, you know it's just not going to sound as good. It's not optimized is the word we use around here a bunch, right? Absolutely not. No, you, you make it a lot of sacrifices. Yeah, by doing yeah, that. yeah. The dog is starting to chase the tail a little bit there. And then flip side of it, I, I just did this recently with a, a client where they were having. Uh, some distortion issues and I could tell that they were overdriving the front end of that transmitter. It was on one particular singer who was very loud, you know, had a lot of output and, you know, I'm sure they just took all of their wireless mics and set them all at the same level for the singers and said, here you go singers. And this lady could really belt it out, but it, you know, you could tell it just did not sound right. It did not sound natural at all. And sure enough, that's what was happening was overdriving the input side of it. Yeah. The excuse, Hey, but we set them all the same. <laughs> yeah. Well, wait I've a minute. i into that. Yeah. yeah. Nope, don't do that. <laughs> so, you know, I'm going to kind of show off this, uh, this little third-party app that Carl turned me on to. It's called Electro RM, And I've got it set up where I can actually, uh, through the use of a, uh, you know, they call it a, what do they call it, a dweedle? Is that what it is now? Yeah, dweedle tone. That's a the nickname. Dweedle it's, tone, a, right. it's a DTMF type tone. or It's, it's, in, it's like a modem telling the uh, transmitter to change settings. Here, I'll give you an example of it before I send it. This is what it sounds like. Right, so just like a modem, right? So I'm going to go ahead and uh, actually send this to that microphone. you got to do it acoustically, so I'm going to send it back through the speaker uh, and see if we can change this level. All right, so I'm going to let some I'll let the audio run, and we hopefully we'll see this level. Let's see if I can pull this off here. Whoops. I might need to turn down the level a little bit so it doesn't compete. And yeah, you can see it has considerably more level now, right? Yeah, it came up. Might even go up a little more here. Let's uh, let's give it a little, let's give it another three dB. It's looking better. Let's go one more. All 
There we go. That's looking pretty healthy. So, I mean, obviously you wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't want to do this during a performance, obviously. <laughs> but, you know, the thing that uh, Carl pointed out for me with these devices is that um, this is for people that, uh, you know, for stage performers where you might have a pack and a lav that's hidden under clothing, etc. And to get in there and make adjustments on it is pretty tough. Uh, if you don't have something like this to go, you know, post in some some gain changes given uh, the demands of that particular artist. So this is a nice way to do it. I actually watched a video of a guy doing it, uh, and it, it was pretty funny watching him walk up to the artist and just kind of bleep, and, you know, all of a sudden their mic level would change. I thought that was pretty clever. But, you know, really my only reason for showing it as much as anything is to sh just to show that we need to monitor this. We need to address it. It is a function of gain stage that we need to address and always be aware of. And more importantly, I think, have ways to change this, right? Have ways to address this. So, you know, I, I'll i be honest, in my life, until I got into doing award shows and stuff, you know, I had been away from wireless for a little while. I hadn't done a whole lot of it. Uh, and then I was really thrown right into the fire, you know, doing award shows where we might have, no exaggeration, 30 wireless microphones, 30, 40 wireless vocal mics, let alone wireless instrument mics. So what became really readily apparent was how blind you do it as the mixer. You know, you are really relying on somebody uh, backstage who has good control over that RF system and good monitoring control over that RF system and can go out and make changes as needed, right? Otherwise, boy, you can get into some pretty hairy trouble there. Uh, so, you know, I'll make my first ploy. You know, and in the year 2021, we need, especially given that we have digital consoles now, we need to be able to have some insight into this. So I don't, I don't care whether it's a, you know, a computer monitor sitting near the console that's running the software where you can keep track of all of these channels and monitor them and maybe say to somebody backstage, hey, uh, go up to Joe's wireless there and change the level for me, please. Okay, uh, let's get that sorted out. Obviously, you want to do it in, in as close to a sound check environment as you can do it. I want to be changing that for everybody. Hopefully, a monitor engineer would have a good handle on that as well. So uh, let's go back. Uh, maybe we'll go to a vocal track here and look at the Sennheiser one. Robert, if I can jump in one more thing here. Sure. I'm talking about gain. I sort of only said the first half, which is analog wireless. The range can be affected by too little gain. But with digital wireless, it's fully modulated all the time. Right. And so audio level is only going to affect your signal to noise ratio. Yeah, that's uh, certainly one of the advantages to digital transmission for sure. But, you know, as we all know in the lab, we talk about this all the time. It's a matter of managing trade-offs, right? So to get that, we're going to get we're going to give up some latency. We're going to give up some other elements. Uh, you know, the it may not if it drifts or et cetera, it may not do that quite as gracefully as uh, FM does. But that's all that's all stuff that we have to kind of put on the scales and balance when we're getting ready to do shows. Right. Excuse me. Yes. Um, may I have? May I have, I have a question? May I have, ask Carl a couple questions real quick? Of course. Yeah. Please, by all means. Thank you. Uh, okay, Carl. Um, I wanted to confirm this: the difference between sens sensitivity gain versus output gain on the receiver. Um, could you clarify that for me, please? Sure. So, the transmitter is where your original mic preamp would be. If, uh, if you could compare it to a console and you've got your trim or gain, right? You're plugging your mic into the console and turning up the gain to get a good amount of level. That happens at the transmitter in a wireless system. And then it's encoded in whichever way it is, transmitted FM or digitally. And then when you get to the receiver, you have some control over the output level of the receiver. So generally like with what you have to do with a console, you wanna get a nice fat signal at the front end and then you can mix it as you wish you want to get a good signal to noise over the channel noise of the transmission itself. So that's kind of what Robert's talking about and getting an adequate level in the front end so that then you can do what you need to do at the back end and not add noise by adding gain. You, you can attenuate and bring everything down if you need to, to match mic level, for instance, at the input of a console, but um, you don't want to have to boost at the console. Right. I think it's fair sense. to look at that wireless system as one complete system of audio, right? No different than a console. I yes. mean, you make a great analogy there where you have a console, input gain, output level. I, I have that control on a console as well, right? And if I don't have enough input gain for any source, 
I am not going to feel like I have enough output on the console, right? If I don't, if I have my preamp gain way, way down, I'm not going to be able to get enough fader gain and output gain to drive the subsequent system, meaning the PA system, adequately. Same thing applies there in the micro, right? We have a preamp, even in digital, we have preamp to a digital converter, transmitted through another digital converter to analog, and an output section that goes to the subsequent mixer, right? So if that's not optimized, it's going to get out of, pa out of whack farther downstream, right? You're going to make more and more uh, compensation for it downstream. Is that making Very sense to you there? Uh, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, one, just to follow up these questions and seal it good, um, in relation to mic or line level out, out of the receiver, uh, how does this relate to, you know, whether you're going to do the sensitivity on the mic or whether you're going to do the, the boost on the uh, transmitter output level? Does that mean now you should go back to mic level output or line level output? Uh, well, as as I mentioned earlier, those are those are two different things. And, and I, again, I'll take the discussion of gain structure in the console as a very similar process here. You, I don't think you want to treat input sensitivity and output gain as an either or. That's where we get into trouble with it, right? You need to treat treat input sensitivity as one thing. I need to set that and get it optimized, right, for the transmission. And then I need to decide how much output level I need for the next stage. You follow me there? So don't make it an either or. You're going to have, yes. you know, let's, let's set input sensitivity correctly. And then at the output, you've got to decide, do I need that to be mic level or do I need it to be line level? And you can make a choice, right? Yes, that's what I needed to hear. That, that completely uh, proves my theory and uh, my practice. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Good, good. All right, we got a couple other hands raised. I'm going to get to these guys too. Uh, Gear, my friend Gear is in the room. This is my huh. this is my remote library. Gear is my remote <laughs> library. He sends me lots of stuff before we start. <laughs> Thank you. You're too kind. Um, I'm sorry, I was late to the party, and I just uh, because we had uh, being uh, oh, speaking of the remote library, uh, we had an AES event in Norway. Uh, so uh, on. Uh, so I, I'm, that's why I'm late. So, but if you need a library, go to AS. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the plug. Um, I, so I, I came into the party just when I heard about these tones, and I was I didn't hear the introduction. Are you saying that you have a system where you somehow decide I want to increase again by X amount, and I it creates a tone, and you go over to the mic, and it sends it in, and it does it. Uh, yes, Carl's uh, system has that. It's uh, a third-party app, apparently. I don't think Electrosonics developed the app. It's called Electro RM. I'll try to put a uh, Yeah, but the receiver, or no, excuse me, the, the transmitter needs to have some sort of listening capability for that. That would be called a microphone gear. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Uh, yeah, okay, so it doesn't do that automatically. No, it, it it has to hear that tone. It has to hear that modem tone, and it hears it via the microphone. But the but the transmitter then detects that tone through the microphone and does something. It makes an adjustment. Correct. Yeah, it's, it's just sending yes. data to it, saying, "Okay, set the gain here." Yeah, but that is then something Electrosonics have, and the, your competition does not. Uh, I haven't investigated the competition to know whether they can do something like that. And, and like I said, this is not an electrosonic product. This is a third-party app running on an iPhone. Yeah, we share the data set of the instructions, and then third-party app developers can use uh, that. Okay. There and, you go. So uh, that is your electrosonic. Uh, mm -hmm. That's clever. It is pretty clever. clever. Now, I, I, I had asked this question, so I'll answer it uh, for Carl. This is not available for handheld mics. It's only available for their belt pack series. Uh, Etc. So you know you wouldn't yeah, walk up it, to somebody and go right in their face and get it to change. You know well, that's <laughs> very PA. You don't want it to go over the PA, like you no, said. No. And you don't want it to go over the PA. Yeah, that would be a problem. That would be a problem. Well, that's clever in a in a, in a large. Uh, well, you have the. Oh, what do you do with guitar? Guitar um, belt packs. I just probably hold it right to the pickup. It might work there. But I, I don't know that Carl's, you know, I don't know. I don't know that it'll handle it or not. I'm, I'm, no, but, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here answering the question. I don't know. 
you know, for transmitters where we felt like it's not going to be buried on the talent, it's, it's really a feature designed when the transmitter is hidden and inaccessible. Uh, with guitar yeah. packs, are usually on a yes. strap or a handheld yeah. mic. It's, yeah. it's right there. You just yeah. do the Let's do it on, sir. That's the idea. Well, anyway, kudos for a very, very good um, feature. Yeah, that's, I thought it was uh, pretty clever. I, I was like, that's, hey, that's actually, that's actually pretty good. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. It's clarified. Thank yeah, you. No problem. Uh, Michael Fraley, go, man. Hey, um, so on the same topic, is there parameters that you're setting in the app? Um, you know, or uh, how, in other words, how is it telling the pack yeah, whether yeah. to adjust up or down? What's, I'll what, see what's if going I can on get it that? on camera here. Hang on. Let me see if I, I can know, show it as well see if you this. want. No, yeah, right now you're you're because you have the big thing up, we can't see it. Yeah. There Carl's got it up there too. Get He's got there. it where you just yeah. so you can change your gain or your frequency settings. You can put the unit to sleep and then you arm it and send it to the to the uh Oh, pack. okay. Yeah. So, it's got all the settings for the transmitter and there's different transmitter series represented because we've been doing this for about 10, 12 years. And so it's it's evolved over time, and the app developer just adds another data set. So you're allowing us humans to mess it all up again. Okay, good. Oh, you can mess it up big time <laughs> with that thing if you sent you know sent out to an entire group there. That would be fantastic. You know? yeah, wow. It has to be close proximity, you know, reflection uh, to mess it up, but you can send it over walkies. And, no, I, well, I mean, you know, you still a human is still making the decision on gain yes. free all, all that kind of stuff. Of course, so. yes. I was I was making a little joke. Sorry. Right. No, I mean, I understand. We've come to expect it from you, Michael. Thank you. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. All right. So, uh, you know, really on the, uh, I'm going to run a little short on time here, so I'm going to need to get going. On the right, you see in the, uh, the Sennheiser unit, right? So similar sort of thing there. Uh, and they have kind of a, and I might let them talk. I might let Joe talk to a little bit about this. They have a similar kind of push-pull that can happen with data here, but it's not not quite as easy there, but you, obviously it's open to all their products. And in terms of being able to manage huge numbers of wireless systems, uh, you know, the WSM software uh, can handle a lot. Uh, let me get some, let's get that going there. So obviously on, the, uh, on their uh, meter, you can see things like battery life, all that kind of thing. And here is the actual audio level being presented by the transmitter, right? And you can see it's kind of working in a, in a dB full scale there. So remember, we've always discussed, well, okay, you know, minus 20 should output uh, line level to the next stage if we do that uh, in this situation. And, you know, to me, this, as we've talked about previously in the lab, you know, this becomes just as important if we're working in analog, maybe more important in digital, where we've got an A to D conversion that is going to take place after this preamp, right? No different than in our consoles. There's going to be an A to D conversion that takes place there. And we want to have good bit depth resolution there. So again, you know, this is, you know, it's it's all just kind of gain structure 101, but, you know, because it's a far away and it's not in our console, it's very easy to lose sight of what's going on here. So similar sort of thing here, right? If we, if you notice, we've got enough level in that microphone, we should be able to drive it to line level. So if we take a look here at the Sennheiser Dante and the Sennheiser AES outputs, look, at, I, I have no ability to adjust gain on them, right? The, the analog output or the audio output on the receiver does not affect Dante and AES. Look at where it comes up. It's almost a unity gain pass through right to line level in the console, right? I mean, on the console, I have, you know, plus or minus, I think 10, maybe, what is it here? Yeah, I have plus or minus 20 dB there if I want to use it. But if I just keep it at, you know, at zero offset, you notice it comes right back to unity gain there, so line level. So again, I just use that as a really good kind of starting point to say, okay, how much level is needed to get to an acceptable level on the output there? It's a really nice way to check different systems and, and see what their different sensitivities are. Does that make sense to my experts in the room? Does that, uh, does that seem like a viable thing to do? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it can keep your head in the game in terms of just, well, how much gain is needed for any, any given thing, you know? 
All right, uh, let's see. Where do we go from here? I, I got to get going here. Otherwise, we're going to be here for hours. Uh, let me get back to the PowerPoint. If I can. Uh, this guy. Actually, I could do this. I, you know, I've got that. If you want to see this setup, I actually, I, I might as well show you since I did it. Uh, let's see here. Let's stop the share for a second. If we take a look here, this is actually in my office. So you can see the two wireless receivers down there. And this is in an ISO box. There's a, there's a full range coax speaker in that box and all of these microphones are kind of clumped into there right over the center of the speaker to be able to see this and down below it here you can see uh, or you can't see there's a rack below it that's got a set of Hafler amplifiers in there driving that speaker so you can get some sense of it it's pretty easy to set up and play around with I just happened to have the gear sitting around here I thought you know what I'm gonna do this all right let's see how do I get out of no, 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 no. Did you get any interference between the uh, transmitters? Uh, I didn't. Close. No, I mean they're working in pretty different bands. Luckily, it didn't mess with it much. So. All right, so we'll get back to this now. Uh, Joe, if you're in the room, or Volker, if you're in the room, anything you want to add to the conversation on, you know, audio gain structure there before we carry on here? Well, I kind of echo what uh, Carl was was talking about, and in in general, you know, my rule of thumb is to uh, set the transmitter sensitivity so you're getting full modulation if it's an analog system um, and uh, uh, if it's digital, just, you know, so there's no distortion. And at the receiver, my default is to have the receiver turned up to line level and, and go into a line level input uh, of a console rather than, um, you know, turning down the, uh, turning down the receiver to mic level. Yeah. But, uh, but, uh, you know, you made that point. Well, if you're going to hot swap it with a, a wired mic, I could see how that, uh, that makes sense to go down to mic level. Yeah. I mean, for the purposes of doing this here, I, I think I did this on the, for the next segment here. You know, if you really want to check whether you're getting to line level output on that receiver, instead of bringing it into your console into a mic pre, just bring it into an insert return. Right. That way, there's no preamp in play there, and make sure make sure your metering is set up to look post insert, and you'll know immediately how much output is coming from that receiver. Right, and it because it should see line level there. If it if it doesn't go right to minus twenty or zero VU there, then you've got some offset in there somewhere. You know, you're not you're not either not driving the transmitter hard enough, or you got another gain stage in there that's knocking it up or down. Right. That's a that's a good kind of foolproof method to check and see what the output of that receiver is just bring it into an insert return also i just want to kind of tell a story of um you know some singers are just really powerful yeah um and uh whitney houston was an example but uh josh groban was using um one of our transmitters and even though they had turned down the sensitivity all the way down Wow. He was still distorting. Um, he was still over-modulating the mic. Because um, he was using the Neumann head, mm -hmm. you know, which is a, a very sensitive mic. So what we had to do was actually uh, put a resistor in a, uh, uh, like a, a negative feedback loop within the capsule to pad down the capsule yeah. even further so that the output of the capsule didn't overdrive or overmodulate the transmitter. Wow. 
And I'll tell you something. I mean, I'm just sitting here running that through my head how you would discover that. If you didn't have a way to look at that that gain, there's no way you would know. You know, I mean, if you if you didn't have the ability on, you know, in software or in browser or whatever you're looking at, if you didn't have a way to 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 actually know that, you're you would have to rely solely on your ears to tell you what's going on there. And you know, that gets tricky in transmission because you know, as the guys said, especially in FM transmission, you know, it, you're not really going to overmodulate it. You're just going to get so deep into the limiters, it's going to sound like crap, you know. And that's a different kind of quote unquote distortion to be able to hear. Uh, some of the places that I've gone to, that's what's tripped them up. They're not, they're not interpreting what they're hearing as being in the limiters of that, uh, of that transmitter, you know. And once we get that cleaned up, they're just startled how much better the microphone sounds, you know. So, you know, you can also uh, monitor the um, the trajectory of the the audio uh, meter on the receiver. I mean, if uh, yeah, yeah, you know, someone. Um, so you, you don't can see the range there, right? Software for yeah. for it, yeah. And it's it's probably worth noting. And guys, correct me if I'm wrong here. You know, Carl, Joe, either one. Even when we're looking at it in software, there, right? We are looking at the receiver end of that gain. Is that right? It's not output gain we're looking at there, but we're looking at it actually at the receiver. So, you know, it is post transmission, even though it's correlated, it's post transmission, right? But that information comes through. You can see if yeah. it's going into limiting and things like that. So, right, right. It gives you enough to know for most things. But like what Joe's talking about, if you're overloading the mic preamp in, in there, uh, that's another issue. Yeah, yeah. It's cool. It's inter interesting. Interesting topic. Keep... All right. Let's. Uh, I'm sorry. Somebody else have something there? Yeah, that's me, Falco. Sorry. Hey. Um, you have to keep one thing in in mind. There is a significant difference in gain structure setting and the importance if you compare an analog with a digital system. Yeah. Um, because in the analog system, you are using so many different things like pre-emphasis, de-emphasis you're using compressor expanders. So if the gain setting is not right for the audio, it has such a humongous impact yeah, to yeah. the entire sound. So it is from the experience which we see not as critical if you go for a digital, a full digital system. Yeah. So the traditional FM system with compressor, expander, the compander circuit, the pre-emphasis, de-emphasis, Sensitivity setting is so much more important. Yeah. I mean, let's compare that to what our normal mixer workflow is, guys. If you had equalization, compression, gating, set up on a channel, pre-set up, right? Then that's based on an expectation of a mic pre-level for the signal coming in, right? And, and let's say you couldn't change those things on the console. Well, you know, you, you're going to have to get a certain level to get those thresholds to work right on the channel, right? That's no different than what Volker is saying there. You know, all of those components, the, the compander circuits, the pre-emphasis, de-emphasis, those are expecting a certain level to be optimized for their operation, right? So if, if we have that gain too far down or too high, those parts of the system are not going to operate effectively. They're not going to operate in an optimized setting. So, yeah, I mean, I 100% I agree there. And, that's what, and to me, that's part of what makes this so tricky, right? But, you know, to one degree, I think it actually helps us that we only have one thing to adjust <laughs> to get it <laughs> to operate right. Please don't give us control of all the companding and the limiting and all the other stuff. I don't know that we can handle that right now. You know? so. All right. Uh, well, we got to move on here because we're right coming up on an hour here. So let's move on to ear monitor and let's, let's turn the transmission around the other way here. So similar sort of thing. I've just thrown up this, you know, kind of generic circuit here, but similar concept here, right? We're going to transmit a stereo mix now, and we're going to take it out, and we're going to really only concentrate on the audio portion of this, right? What's happening in audio land here, and where can we adjust it? We need, we need to get these signals optimized as well uh, for use back to drive ear monitors, right? Now, I, I'm just going to forewarn you, I'm not going to get into the discussion here today of out, output impedance of your packs and impedance of your headphones, etc. Uh, I'm going to take that as a little bit of a constant here for the, the, uh, the, the points of this discussion, right? That we're going to have a low impedance output on that pack 
you're going to have probably relatively low impedance headphones that are going to be driven here and be able to get enough gain here out of the actual pack. So we're going to, we're going to keep that as a constant here. All right, so for this, uh, oh, sorry, and same sort of thing applies for digital here, right? If we have a digital system that do this, again, we have to pay attention to the gain on both ends of this uh, when addressing the A to D and the D to A conversion, right? We know that is a particular part of it. All right, so we're going to do a similar kind of thing here, funny enough. Uh, we're going to take an output uh, from my console. I'm going to drive it into this PSM uh, unit, and then we're going to take the output of these packs and bring them back into the console. And again, I, I've just brought these outputs right into insert returns here. They aren't coming into mic pre's or anything like that. Uh, we just want to look at what the relative output level of those packs are coming back. We wanna, we're basically just using the console as a big meter here. Okay, so that's what we're going to do here. I'm going to mute your mic, sir, if that's all right. Thank you for joining. All right, and then we'll maybe we'll even do a little bit of smart analysis on this, do a little transform of input to output and see what signal looks like, you know, pre and post transmission. Uh, so let's have a look there. Let's see, what have I got left here? Yeah, so the question here is, right, how hard do I have to drive the transmitter to achieve line level out of the receiver? That's kind of what we're going to look at here and see if we can figure out, right? So let's see, I've got, I'm just going to use some, we're going to use some tone first. We'll just start with a 1K tone. And let me see if I can get it where you can see this metering. That will be here, I believe. There we go. All right, so I'll just pull these down since we don't need that there. So this is the output of those two packs. Get this over where you can see it. So the far right channels, you can see I got them labeled Lab RF and Smart RF. Uh, that's just those two channels coming in. And you can see if I, uh, I wish, oh, actually, let me get this up where you can see it too. One second here. Let's get this. Out of the way for a sec. Put this over with this. All right. So what you're looking at on the left-hand side there is the input to the transmitter, right? We're looking at the signal going to the transmitter. So if I turn it down, you can see it all go down. So this is just a 1K at line level uh, in the console being pushed out at unity gain right to the receiver, right? This is no audio offset in the receiver. There's no attenuation or anything. Let me just verify that here. Make sure I have it. Yes, that's right. So there's no audio attenuation there. So as it sits right now, if I have line level coming into the unit and I take a look at the pack output to get back to line level, matter of fact, I'll do this just to prove that it's working here. So that's me just turning the volume control all the way down. Sorry, I booted it here. And so I'm just turning up the actual headphone volume until I get it back to line level, right? And that is at about 50% right now on the receiver. So we got a nice transfer there, right? So um, if we want to take a look at that in pink noise. Let's do that for a second. And maybe do a little transform here. So that's pink noise now. It's over there. Let's get this up here. We'll have a look at this as well. Okay, so you can, and remember, this is on the back side of the. Receiver. This is the output of the receiver pack we're looking at against the input uh, to the re, uh, the transmitter, right? So you can kind of see some you know, the high frequency boost, the low frequency boost, some of the low roll off there. And honestly, it sounds like that if you listen back to the pack, you can hear some of that hyping in the top and the bottom on it. Uh, but you know, 
I think I haven't done too much troubleshooting with monitor guys on this situation, but you know, sometimes I hear of guys that say, I, I the artist just can't get their pack loud enough. They can't I, like they've got their pack turned all the way up, you know. And I just think, man, if you've got your gain structure sorted out, I don't know how any receiver pack could be turned all the way up. I mean, I, I've tried it with this setup right here, just running some music back through it after kind of seeing this here and getting, you know, getting my music level at roughly line level output or maybe just a hair above. And man, I, I can't get that pack past halfway without it just being absolutely deafening, you know. And that's with a regular pair of in ears. I, I mean, I'm using the Jerry Harvey stuff here, but that's true of, you know, even if I go up in impedance of headphones a little bit, you know, maybe like a pair of Sure big muff headphones I still there's no way I could get that pack all the way up without just you know my vision blurring so you know interesting uh, concept here but I I think it's a similar situation in terms of gain structure and here is a situation I think where you know you want to take that audio output and use it to your advantage because it's an attenuator in this situation right where you're gonna have uh, output coming from your console that you might need to attenuate down because let's face it on our outputs especially on digital consoles even on analog consoles for that matter we're not necessarily running at line level output we've got 24 db of headroom in those outputs and we're regularly way up there right i mean uh, even on you know on this console you know to see your output you know rms well above you know line level is not uncommon so you might need to do some offset there but, you know, it also kind of speaks to getting your gain structure in order, right? Do I actually need to drive the output that hard if I'm, if I'm just turning down the, the transmitter to get it to all fit in? You know, that, that's one of those things that, that is always a red flag for me. If I'm having to kind of turn up or down subsequent stages as I get farther into the audio, that's telling me something generally. It's like, you've got, you've got your gain structure out of whack here somewhere, especially if it's any significant amount of... Uh, information right so I, I'm sorry I could I didn't I I won't say nobody from sure showed up because I didn't ask them uh, I didn't have anybody that I could get a hold of from sure to come in and talk about this but I would love to hear some feedback and some input from guys here today who have done monitors and have used ear systems that might want to speak to this a little bit is anybody in the room that is willing to come in on on Vox and speak to this Got to be somebody. Nobody. I, I, I'm actually encouraged by nobody in this room ever doing monitors. It's all front of house guys. That's, that's all we got here. Hey, Robert. Yeah, go ahead. If you're if you're, you're going to do another one, my friend Jason Lawful, I'm sure would come uh, and talk. I'm sure. Um, I used to work with him on my Showtime boxing shows many years ago. He moved to Nashville and he works for sure um, these days. Yeah, sure. Just uh, drop me his name, etc. And uh, I, I'm kind of roughly planning on a part two of this that's going to deal specifically with transmission and reception. So uh, I'm happy to bring him in on that one and we'll, we'll discuss it there. Ken Newman of Thousand Oaks, you are live and on <laughs> yeah, the air. Robert. So I was, uh, I'm just sort of wondering, reading into what you're doing there. So you could take the output of the console and put it right into your ear monitors then. And it would be the same level at the at the setting that you have the that's knob correct at on the yeah receiver, right? i mean okay. given the drive we might have we might have to take a an examination of impedance, Could be impedance there. problems but. Yeah. yeah 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 but but anyway the so my question is is what kind of level do those in-ear monitors need in order to get to what kind of spl at your eardrum you know does anybody know yeah well well i mean i'm, I'm going to use this as the example um Ken, and I'll, I'll just throw this at you. So I'm going to turn off the noise and just send in some music here. Let's get this kind of sorted out. And you can see that it's a pretty good transfer there, right? So that's actual music going in. Don't get fooled by the, the slow uh, screen redraw. And I can tell you with that music set right there, this is obviously it's pre-recorded music. It's not live music. But with that music setting right there, I cannot get the pack up past halfway. I just cannot do it. Halfway, you know, one o'clock is, that but would, that would exhaust me in 10 minutes, 15 minutes. The, but there's other factors that come into play, like the sensitivity of your ear, ear monitors. Like, for example, when you plug in a pair of headphones into a ear monitor pack, 
they're considerably quieter, right? Than the they can be. Are. Yeah, they can be. And usually, I think that's because of the impedance of the headphone, right? That's sure. What's but effective. anyway, the sensitivity involved uh, is a big factor in terms of where you're going to sit your knob. But so, but just for reference, your knob is set at about twelve o'clock on your pack right now on the, the, on the meters here. that we're seeing. That's correct. Twelve o'clock. Yeah. Good to good to know. Good to know. Yeah. And and I've you know throughout the week when I was prepping this I was going back and forth between the Jerry Harvey ear monitors and a pair of Shure headphones etc. And it wasn't dramatically different. I mean I think the Shure headphones come in at about 40 ohms, 35, 40 ohms, and the Jerry Harvey thing is about eight ohms if I remember right. I think the output impedance on the pack is one. So my experience tells me that with my V6s, you know Sony headphones, typical typical yeah. V6s of which I don't know the, what the impedance is of those. If I plug a pair of those into a pack, into a ear monitor pack, those are 32 plug ohms. In, okay, so anyway, I plug in that, and then I plug in a pair of ear monitors. The ear monitors are at least 10 dB louder. Yeah, yeah, could be. Yeah. I, I it wouldn't surprise me in terms of sensitivity to make it that way for sure. But that you know that even speaks more to the idea of how is anyone having a pack all the way up with ear monitors if gain structure is properly sorted out there? You know, could be threshold shift too. I mean, they're, they're you know, once they get up there and they've got the stage noise and everything else going on. Yeah, uh, peace. It, it may be part of it. I just I, I I don't think I'd be able to talk for a day after having that on for two and a no. half hours. You and me both. I, I don't I don't I mean, understand that, it myself. That on a completely side topic that really concerns me for what's going on with people's hearing over a period of time you know over the course of a tour it's like how loud are you monitoring man at the ear there's right? where you want to get uh rich santucci is that his name rich you know from uh, uh yeah sensophonics you want yeah, to get him I, involved in that discussion right. yeah he's great i i, I michael 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 santucci, michael, santucci. Yeah. michael that's it michael yeah. thank you yeah, I've, I've conversed off and on with him for many many years i mean even i, I think the first time i met him he we were doing uh, ear monitors. The first time we ever tried it with Rush in the late '80s, early '90s, you know, he was making some of his own product, and we were taking that out and try it. Yeah, he's very, very sharp guy. Really good guy too. Yeah. I have a comment on this actually that I'd yeah. like to ask. So I know that Joe is here from Sennheiser, and uh, Carl from Letro, and it's the first topic you're talking about. And I'm going to ask, at least in the case of Letro and Sennheiser say in the Sennheiser 6,000, in the 9,000 at least, and then in Letro products and probably the Sure, probably in the Axiom, to have a grip of what is going on at the transmitter remotely and being able to adjust it. And therefore, the throughput to look at these systems, whether it's in-ear, and to get a grip on throughput and I.O. from the head end of the system, not just with lav mics, and by the time we push it to the console, with zero VU, zero DBM, or if we're in the digital domain, that having a grip all the way to in-ears where we can get a grip of what the aggregate acoustic level factoring in impedance of the transducer so that we can get a grip on how much delivery we're going to get out of it. I think you know where I'm going with this, Robert, probably. If we would have an interface within these systems where we can see that so that you know, we can measure the thing empirically, and a lot of people aren't quite there technically on the measurement of that, but I'm up for it totally so that we can get a grip, you know, by the time we say temporary threshold shift, all right, just how loud is it? Because I think we can make a measurement <laughs> at the end, yeah. just, you know, acoustically. Audio Precision's got a deal going on this, but I, I think there's there are other boxes for measuring how much is coming out of the in-ear, you know, and if we could dial that, whether, you know, that would be awfully helpful throughout systems, um, you know, whether it was, you know, through the wireless, man. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I got to believe that, uh, take out the actual how you do it uh, out of this. I got to believe that's possible scientifically. I mean, math, that's, I don't want to call it simple math, but that's math, right? You bet. And yeah. I mean, I mean, if this guy is getting nailed with, X number, you know, of a SPL right at the air canal. Okay, well, let's let's say that, you know, and, and it's not distorted. It's gain structure properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy, that would be helpful. Um, okay. Here. I mean, it would, you know, it would always be helpful to know, too, you know, talking about threshold shift, 
I mean, be able to measure. I mean, walk out there and measure what is happening at the guy's ear outside the ear monitor and what's happening inside the ear monitor. You know, let's, you know, let's find out what's happening there. I mean, somebody's got to be doing that analysis here. Or we're going to end up with a whole bunch of deaf musicians here. Well, that's <laughs> just know? a voltage measurement, isn't it? I mean, really, at the end of the day. Well, it's an acoustic measurement too, though, right? Yeah. Voltage and sensitivity of the drivers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm I mean, it seems sure like Michael's that. way all over that stuff. I got to believe he is. I, yeah, I know he's he been is. studying that Definitely. for so long. Yeah, I, you know, I'll I'll make the commitment here. I'll try to get him in here at some point to talk about this if we ever come back to this. I, you know, if it makes sense to bring him in on the transmission one, we'll do it. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, would that be a hard thing to program on the on the uh, transmitter packs? You know, well, it's not a it's not a matter of programming that though. It's a matter of how do you gather the data, because you got to get I a think, sense of SPL, acoustic yeah. SPL in an ear canal and external to the ear canal. And right. uh, and each ear monitor that you're going to use is going to have a different sensitivity, isn't it? Well, yeah, right. that, yes, it will. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. If you know the numbers, if you can plug sure. in the numbers, it, the math is there, and then it's just making the acoustical evaluation. But that, that's what I was getting at though: is the belt pack could measure what that sensitivity is you know as soon as you plug it in the trick is in the telemetry is what i'm hearing it it because the transmitter knows what levels it's seeing at various places a receiver knows what level the trick for a receiver be getting it back in if it were a belt pack but on a transmitter side yeah it's just getting that in the data stream with with the audio i i desperately want our experts to chime in on this well, you know, I mean, right after they stop laughing, Michael Lawrence, <laughs> Michael, Michael Lawrence, you know, from the Signal to Noise podcast, he does a lot of SPL testing. And I'm pretty sure I heard him talking about doing SPL testing. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah, I'll, I'll look for it. I'm sure there's some sources out there. But to your point about the pack knowing, I think all the pack would be able to know is the impedance of the drivers, because there's no way for it to measure the acoustic sensitivity of the driver. You know, a given amount of voltage, what do you get, you know, out of it? And in terms of sound pressure, there's no way for the pack to know that. Right, but I think that could, that's could where the math that, comes though? in because we know what the sensitivity of the transducer is in theory. That's where that's where on the on the sure. user end that would have to be a computation, not coming from the pack itself. Or, or the maybe pack would if have you to added that if you added that to the pack's capabilities, you know, so that that was something the pack was programmed to accept was the uh, the sensitivity of each ear monitors you are using. You type that into your sensitivity, and then it gives you the resultant SPL at the earpiece, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, or even the manufacturers putting out publication. Hey, for you know the, the JH sixteen, here's here's your your range. You type that you know you you select that, let's say, on the pack, and then it you know it measures the uh, the sensitivity, um, or the impedance rather. I'm sorry, uh, it measures the impedance and calculates the difference, and then maybe even the system could throw a red flag at the uh, at the engineer when you're well no seriously when you're when you're starting to hit critical mass and and looking to do some damage yeah, you know it, and it, they would, it and flashes they red at you flag. hey you're you're yeah. you're hurting your artist down they, they'd be looking for the way to defeat that warning exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly my point yeah i i know some that would absolutely and if you, know, you follow the rules would... you and if you follow the rules they will definitely come back to you and say it's not loud enough right. because right. yeah yeah based on, hear that. on work standards so it's it's way below 90 db and then we all know question, we yeah, all know too that there's be. artists out there that are stoned dead. i mean al cooper from blood sweat and tears that that man is deaf 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 i hit him with two turbo sound uh double 15s with a one and a quarter inch horn four and a half feet away with him crank to death and he's like man it sounds great can you turn it up i'm like dude i got no fader left you know? i can turn it up well, but the well, amps well, how, how many how many people how many artists use that uh that built-in what uh, maximum level control that that the sure pack has you familiar with that right what's it called like uh it's a limiter what it's called. They have, yeah some kind well, of they have a max there. yeah there's like a hard max level that you want yeah. you can't turn it up past that yeah. So how many th how many artists do you think actually use that? I'm thinking they're all bypassed. <laughs> Usually they are. So and and we have this setting in our in your packs as well. So it is normal that, you know, it's interesting to see. It is a software 
feature that you can turn it on and off, right? So guess what is happening, right? Uh, hey, Robert, I just posted in the chat a link to uh, Mimi, which is a little device for uh, measuring IEMs. Uh, it's great for doing transfer functions on your ears. Um, it's really useful. Awesome, Josh. Thank you, man. I, you know, I've been kind of thinking about trying to get one of those now that I'm in IEM land here a little bit, trying to do some stuff like that. Yeah, that would be fun. Is it an expensive device? Five. No, it's only like 100 something euros ish, which is not that expensive when you consider it, you can use it with any measurement mic. So yeah, yeah. So is it just a little coupler that fits on? A yeah, it couples. So it won't replicate your true HFRT or anything like that or your ear canal, but it just will get you in the ballpark in terms of ears uh, for measurement. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for that. Appreciate that. Two quick comments. I, yes, Joe. One of the variables in this equation is, is uh, the, uh, the seal that the earpiece makes within an individual's ear and how deeply he puts in it, puts it in the canal. But um, in general, you know, um, Ear monitors, if, if, if they're done correctly and prudently, they should actually um, preserve musicians' hearing over time versus traditional monitors. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think on, in logic, I would agree with you there. And I'm going to reveal something here. Maybe I better edit this out when I get done here. But, you know, I go to an audiologist every year for a checkup. And... Uh, he says to me, he, he claims to me, he's a, he says, you know, my ears actually look really good for my age, but he says he's betting that the vast majority of damage and de degradation that I have in my hearing is from headphones. He says, I, I don't think it's concert sound that's doing you in. I think it's your headphones that's doing you in. Got it. Uh, hey, Robert. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mix in ear monitors, and um, what happens is if you don't optimize that, you try to optimize everything equally with gain structure across the board. Uh, guys are going to have different levels on their packs depending on their hearing and their deafness, et cetera. Yeah. And I end up, you know, as cueing my mixes, I'm having to turn my cue up louder for this guy, down for this guy, up for this guy. So you really try to get the band to get those packs where they need to be at for each individual so you have some kind of unity across the board. On your mixes out yeah i think that would be the biggest challenge for me because I, I, my approach i can tell you and it would probably it, i don't mix monitors it would probably fall flat on his face but would be to say get all of those mixes at some sort of i, I don't want to say unity but just consistent in terms of output level so that if i'm soloing in and out of them i'm going to have a, a normal process and then let all the variants take place at the volume on the pack is that is that your approach i see you shaking your head Yes, that's true. That's yeah. what I do. I, I you know, because some guys, I won't name names, but they'll tell me I'm saving headroom. And I'm like, do you have a bank no. of headroom when you retire? Or, you know, <laughs> where's the headroom going? You know, get your pack yeah. turned up. My mix is spend your headroom. Room. Spend your headroom. Come on. Yeah, spend your headroom. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm having to tell him, you know, well, he goes, well, Joe Blow's pack is at 12 o'clock. Why is mine here? Because you're deaf or you're not deaf or you have a different sensitivity in your ears. Yeah, I mean, so there may be different parts of the stage, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's really a people thing. You got to work with these guys yeah, left yeah. and right in rehearsals and get it nailed down. And everybody's different. Yeah. But I think my goal, if I was doing that, would be certainly within a few dB consistency in terms of level. Absolutely. Uh, at the output stage of the console. You have you know? to. Yeah. And you have to fight these guys over it sometimes because they just refuse to turn that pack up or down. Yeah, yeah. Right on. It is. And I do stay out of the limbers. I use my own on the console. I'm not going to use what's in the pack. Yes, please. Yeah, well, you want there to is the, the there is the you know giving them the, the giving the artist the benefit of the, of the doubt. There is that uh, what would you call it the sensitivity of the pot. Like if you start getting it down around nine o'clock, you blow on it and it's going to get ten dB louder or something, right? So of course you got to you know get within the ballpark so that they're not in the sensitive part of the pot. Yeah. That's a good question, I, and I'm going to assume that it's a log taper on the. It's not a linear taper on the receivers, right? Yeah, I wouldn't think uh, so. We offer a choice of both, actually, log or linear, depending on what you're doing. If you want, you know, a nice slow taper up, where you have a good range at the low end, logs the way to go. But if you want it to yeah, get a lot sure. fast, linear. And so there's different kinds of customers. Yeah. 
Wow, that's that's interesting. You get make an offer of both. All right. Well, let me uh, let me get back to this for a second, and we'll just wrap this up here before it gets too long in the tooth. Um, so where is it? Uh, yeah, here we go. Robert, one other quick uh, comment about going back to transmitter inputs uh, trim adjustment. Yeah. Um, I have always found that during sound check, the performers never sing as loud as they do in performance. So never ever. I I always I always set the trim with a good deal of headroom with that in mind. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. No, I, that's that uh, that is just a given. Anybody that tells you difference lying through their teeth. So what and performance that goes for the microphone as well as the ear in ear monitors, right? That goes for both ends of the of the system, right? Yeah. And I, you know, and there's also a uh, how do I want to describe this? A, a psycho effect here as well, uh, where they are not, they do not take the same focus into soundcheck that they take into the performance. They're focused on different things. They're thinking about different things. They're reacting to different things, and hence they hear differently than they do during show. I, yeah, if I could make it even rare, more mysterious, yeah. very you know, rare performer that can do the same thing during soundcheck and show. It's yeah. almost, uh, you know, a unicorn. Yeah. Hence the value of virtual sound check, honestly. It, it's across the board with everything because they don't hit drums as hard. Nope. They don't nope. play the guitar as hard. They don't. It's adrenaline. That's the big change. I used to go round and round and round and round with this with the Petty guys because they, you know, when they when they were doing actual sound checks, they would come up. They wouldn't even do Tom Petty songs, right? They come up and do Merle Haggard songs kind of limp through these things and then come out for the show and step on the accelerator and go, whoa, it sounds so different now. Well, yeah, yeah, it does. It doesn't sound like Merle Haggard. I had Merle Haggard sounding great. What are you doing to me? You know, I worked with a band that wouldn't do sound checks for that reason. Yeah, well, I got them to stop. Change. Yeah. I got them to stop because of it. Yeah. The film directors hated me because they lost all their cool footage. <laughs> it was like, right. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> they wouldn't even come in if there was a remote truck there. Yeah. Because yeah. it would be too different yeah. that night. And it was a good thing. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, we'll just wrap up here. Um, I, I just put together, just threw together a little best practices thing. So take it or leave it as you see fit. Uh, in, first, ensure your equipment is properly interfaced. Right. The right outputs are going to the right input sensitivities, et cetera, et cetera. This is, we're in 2021, and I can't believe how often I still see this mishandled, but it is. Uh, dis it, take the time to discover what level of drive is needed uh, to drive your receiver to line level. Figure out what that is, and I, I've just given you a way to do it today. Uh, you know, obviously, you're not going to pull up on a festival day and try to do this at a festival. You know, this takes a little bit of time. But, you know, when you're setting up your units and getting used to them and setting your input and output sensitivities, you know, you can do this in the shop and, and get a sense of what's going on. Uh, and I would encourage everybody, man, if you're a front of house engineer, especially, I, and I'm going to start, I, I kind of, I, I gave this away at the award shows where I don't necessarily have this available. I'm never doing it again. Where I want to be able to see those transmitter gains at the front of house console so that I can contact somebody on stage and say, hey, go to Patty LaBelle's mic and turn that sucker down 20 dB, will you please? So, um, you know, in case they're not monitoring it. So hopefully, like I said, more often than not in the past when I've done that, I've had a monitor engineer who is way on the case uh, with it. But I think I would certainly like to see and just as a point of comfort, et cetera, understand what's going on there before I start turning up mic pre-gains. Uh, and our friends from Sennheiser and, and uh, Electrosonics may not appreciate this, but I'm going to say it. Contact your console manufacturer or your wireless manufacturer, manufacturer, got that spelled wrong, and urge them for more comprehensive integration into a console. And whether it's actually happening at the console or I have that control external, I'm just going to make the play for it right now. As a front of house engineer, I need control of that gain stage. Period. End of story. Please find a way to make it happen for me. Right. And then with regard to um, ear monitors, you know, make sure, I, again, it's kind of a matching situation. Make sure your output pack impedance is matching up well with your ear monitor impedance so that it will drive the ear monitor properly, especially if you've got 
your gain structure sorted out input to output right where you everything's good there so uh again this it you know we're we're big boys this is science we're supposed to understand this uh, we should not be scared of the word impedance and output levels and things like that we should be able to sort these things out but you know you got to pay attention to these things uh, they can certainly snake bite you if you don't do it okay and on that note i'll open the floor back up one more time for any questions if you want hey what was uh, the name of that uh what was that the name of that app again uh it is called electro rm electro rm it is available on the apple store for 25 dollars worth every penny yeah well if i could spell and type properly <laughs> i can't help you there. won't help you <laughs> I can't help you there. You ask for um, the possibility of controlling the gain of the transmitter. Correct. I'm not sure about Schur and Sennheiser or Electrosonics, but I do know that Sony does that for you. I did see that in the in the document you sent me on Sony. Yeah. So, yeah, that's worth noting. I, I did notice that they do give you the ability to do that. So how are they doing that? How, what's the protocol for That's, control um, there? Well, the protocol is, of course, secret, and they would never tell me now <laughs> as I don't work there anymore. But, well, um, I mean, is it? are you controlling it, it as a, a function of transmission? No, it's it's. So they have uh, their, uh, their uh, uh, wireless workbench, which I don't remember the name of. And in that, you can do, you make the control, there are controls that you adjust, and then they transmit it via 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, Got it. So it's a transmission. Antenna. Yeah, it's a transmission. Yeah, to the um, to the res to the transmitter. Yeah. Um, from that computer. So so there's a antenna connected to an interface at the computer, and it sends it over the Wi-Fi or, or the 2.4 gig um, protocol and into the uh, receiver uh, no, uh, transmitter. And is there any kind and, of full duplex in that? Meaning, do you get a confirmation that? The changes happen, oh, yeah. or do yeah, you just yes, see it on yes, the? Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. You can see it on the on the, and I think you can do. I haven't played with it because I don't have um, have it, but uh, I think you can. Uh, I'm pretty certain that you, you can do. Uh, uh, you can do the low pass filter and high pass filter and stuff like that as well. Right. Why you have a lighter? Yeah. And I think there are some competitors that does it. Uh, can you please respond? Are, are you asking uh, Joe Sennheiser and Volker and, and uh, yeah, Carl? Yeah, Joe, Volker and, and Carl. So we are not doing this for our professional equipment. Um, we have some entry stuff where you can see that um, in the duplex protocol. Um, but in general, so we are not doing something like this for our high-end um, devices for a variety of reasons. So that's a, that's a kind of philosophy which is laying behind it. And by the way, Sure is having in their actioned uh, digital systems, they have this capability. Yeah. I would think it would be, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Volker, I, you know, I may be talking about my pay grade here. I would think that would be easier to implement in digital transmission where you got, you know, encryption essentially that can go on there and, you know, have a much more assured uh, results, in general, yeah. you can do it in, in in analog and in digital transmission. It is much more easier to get the feedback. Hey, I recognize what you did to me uh, <laughs> from for, from the transmitter is much easier because I put it simply in the data stream. Right. That's that's my once, point. Once yeah. again, it's kind of philosophy. If you want to do that, or if you say. Mm, this risk is too high. Yeah. So um, it's at the end, it's your choice, right? Yeah. Yeah. I would be pushing for it. So I uh, think Ken, things are headed that way, if I can add that. And, and we don't have that feature either. Uh, but I do, th I see the utility of it. And I think the technical means for making it happen are, are coming and uh, in some cases are already there. And how well it works, I think, is dependent on a lot of factors. You know, you've got a separate transmission channel, so it has to have a clear frequency. And the higher frequencies usually don't have the range as the lower frequencies and so on. So there's some technical hurdles to overcome. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of utility, absolutely. Yeah. 
I'll yeah. completely agree. And, and, you know, it's very interesting. I see this in a lot of tenders written there. Hey, we need this back channel. Uh, and when you talk to people later on, how often do you use it? Not very often. And if you use it, you will use it during sound check. Yeah. Uh, oh, you're talking about an actual co communication? Yeah. yeah. Don't, don't do this in a live performance. The yeah. risk that you switch instead of minus six to plus 16 <laughs> by far too high. And, and you don't want to change frequencies either. So no, no. Um, I'm okay. I'm old school here. I have a runner. Here is a spare mic. Take this one instead of switching frequencies on this on the fly. So yeah. don't do that. Ken, I see you got your hand up there, buddy. Go. Well, I, I, I would say that uh, Sure, with their Axiant system, has that that changing frequency and that whole data stream. You know, it's a separate stream from the audio stream. Uh, you know, so it's, it's they have that very under control anyway. But my question is this. Question is for Carl, uh, because for years, decades, we've heard, or I've heard, and I want to hear what if I'm, what I've heard is correct, that Electrosonics does not have any companding, no compressor on the transmitter, no expander on the receiver, and that's why they sound so much better than anybody else. Is that true? Well, right. Uh, the digital hybrid system is what you're referring to. Uh, we made analog companded systems up until about 2002. Uh, the hybrid systems took over, and we came up with a way that uh, that we ended up patenting that allows transmission over an FM analog link, but it's a a uh, prepared signal using digital uh, signal processing. And uh, yes, the result is what you say: the audio is not compounded, so it does sound, you know, it's flatter, it's measurably flatter, and a little quieter, and it tends to hold up uh, over a longer range as well because of the digital processing. And, and that, and so, do are are there new manu, new manu, new devices by other manufacturers that do the same thing, or is everybody still no. compounding? No, um, a lot of people. Well, there's some companies are still making compounded analog wireless. Uh, that's becoming fewer and fewer. Uh, anyone who's doing what we would call pure digital, in other words, it's, the signal's digitized on transmission, is transmitted over a digital modulation scheme, and then. Uh, recovered at the at the back end, they're not doing any companding as well. So that'd be like the, the Sennheiser 6000 series, the Sure Axiant Digital, our D squared system, and so on. So that's where most companies are moving uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but you know, digital transmission is is not without its challenges. So that's why it's only been happening lately in the last, let's say, five years when you're really seeing digital transmission be solid. Uh, before that, yeah, everyone was doing companded analog. Uh, other than us, up until fairly recently. And is the uh, same thing true of in-ear systems or just microphones? Uh, it's true. Almost all in-ear systems out there are analog FM multiplexed at this point. Yep. Uh, we have a digital system. Uh, I think MyPro has a digital system. Uh, they're not very common yet. So that, there's more challenges to doing that than there are to just doing a single mono channel. Yeah, I was going to say Bam. bandwidth has got to be part of the challenge there, right? Where you're trying to send something at its full bandwidth. Mm -hmm. But you know, it, you know, we haven't even talked about using, you know, microphones as measurement microphones <laughs> in this situation. You know, so another situation where gain structure is crazy important. You know, you want to make sure and have that sorted out, where you're not, you know, over limiting or under, you know, under. Uh, converting etc in the measurement scheme as well even though we're not doing lab measurements out in the in the field but we still accuracy is part of the thing we don't want a hyped microphone in our in our measurement scheme right uh, and i would also add to that robert frequency response uh when we released the vlfc recently we discovered that some wireless mics can't get down to 11 hertz sure. or subwoofers can uh <laughs> which now that's with digital that's gotten a lot better yeah yeah no i would totally buy that yep yeah. Few comments on on Carl's statements, sure. and I completely sign off your statement regarding your electro um, not compounding hybrid system. Um, the big advantage, and this is a big challenge for for every analog compander. Uh, this is the so-called mistracking between compressor on the transmit side and expander on the receive side. They are never ever same. So, and this is so much better with the digital quote to quote 
not existing compander Carl, right? So <laughs> however you name that. So, <laughs> right. so, but but you are doing something, right? Yeah. So and this is a big, big advantage. So the next step, of course, was full digital transmission. Full digital transmission, no compander. Yeah, correct. But data reduction, no free lunch, guys. So there is yeah. always a drawback for everything what we are doing. So we are taking up. If you remember the first MP3 recording, which you heard, awful, right? I remember that I had the first Fraunhofer MP3 recording, Dire Straits. <laughs> this was sounding like, what? Unbelievable. So this is something which, which comes into play when you are talking full digital. Compander uh, is not existing, but data reduction. So we take out data, data, data reduction. Skin. Data reduction as in compression? Lossy compression. Generally. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. To to reduce the data stream, and yeah. and you can yeah. do it in a different ways, right? So you can use um, firmware which takes out data where we think you don't hear it, or you simply say, you know what, I have a twenty four bit A to D converter, but I'm using only eighteen. So right. natural data reduction, right? So I'm not transmitting this. Um, or lower sample rates, that kind of thing. So, or so yeah. lower sample yeah. rates. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The There's one important thing, and this is something which we tackled a little, um, with in-ears. And, and this is, I know that I'm most likely, when I'm leaving this, I'm the most unpopular guy in this entire round here. Um, when we are looking at in-ears, the big difference for most of the system, and Carl, you have your digital one, so but for most of the in your system, they are analog stereo multiplex systems. So, and by saying this, you have a variety of factors which you can play with. For instance, stereo width. If you make the stereo image wider, you are more sensitive, sens sensitive to disturbance. In general, if you have a stereo multiplex system, my recommendation, and Robert, I'm very sorry, so now I'm getting unpopular. <laughs> drive this hard, drive it harder yeah. on the transmit side, because now your signal level will cover a lot of this psh, psh things yeah. which you hear on the receiver side, right? So drive it harder. This is my recommendation. Drive it a little harder than you usually do. Hmm, interesting. My two cents on that. Hey, hey Volker. So, if if for example you make it wider, is that comp tend to make it compress even more now? No, because it's to trying to it. it's trying to eat up more data. No? no, okay. No, no. We are talking analog. We are talking analog. When I'm in an analog system, stereo multiplex, you never ever have left and right channels separated 100%. That's not possible because we are transmitting um, in a stereo multiplex system on the lower audio frequency band, L plus R, left and right channel. And then on the upper side above 19 kilohertz where the pilot tone is. So we are transmitting L minus R. And if we put on the receive side, both together, I can separate left and right channel. So the big advantage of an analog system is I have two, two information on one carrier. I do not have 100% separation. Yeah. If I'm really good, I have 45, 50 dB of left-right channel separation. That's a lot. So as soon as you make this really wide, you hear more often this disturbance from the RF domain. So if you make it narrow, and guys, maybe you remember the good old days, first car stereos, they had a variable stereo image. They could change depending on the FM signal strength, left and right channel separation. It sounds awful because it was pumping all the time, whoops, getting wide and horrible. So fortunately, we do not do this anymore. I, I don't think any of us are that old, Volker. Yeah, you're showing your age. And <laughs> oh was gosh. that a German thing? They had that I, yeah, in German I think what said was blau pump. I'm, I'm, I think I'm that's what he's saying. Well, 
Well, that's. I know. Uh, I know you guys are not as old, but you are still listening to AM radio in your uh, car, right? Come uh, on. No. <laughs> Well, guys, this is, I, I hate to pull the cord on this. I mean, this is a, such a great conversation, but uh, I think it's safe to say we definitely need to have a part two of this uh, that is focused entirely on transmission and reception. Uh, obviously, audio still plays into it to some degree, but uh, I hope this was helpful for you guys today. I, uh, I really appreciate Joe and Volker and, and Carl uh, helping out here. You guys brought great, great insight into this. So thank you very, very much for uh, for coming in and making the time. Uh, I would love to lean on you again. So uh, that is all for today. Uh, I'll try to get the re uh, the replay posted up on YouTube within the next 48 hours or so. But thank you guys very much for coming in. I hope this was helpful to some of you in the, at least some way, uh, maybe to get you thinking about certain things uh, when you're out there working in the world. All right. So until next time, we will see you later. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.